And you, my child, be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. It is such great joy that as we gather as God's people today, that we can truly rejoice that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. So I'd love to invite you to stand as we pray and as we sing. Gracious God, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. We thank you that you are the God who has come into our world and that you have promised to return in glory. So Lord, this day, may all that we say, sing, pray, think and do be a bold declaration of your goodness, of your promises and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.
do, please be seated for our Kids Talk. Have you ever been so full of excitement about an upcoming event that you just couldn't wait for it to arrive? You might find yourself crossing off the days on the calendar, telling all your friends about it, or making lists of the things you hope and dream will happen when it finally arrives. Sometimes just the thought of the event and the waiting can fill us with such excitement and anticipation. And certainly at this time of year, it's easy to get caught up in the excitement of Christmas and sharing that joy with family and friends. But although writing Christmas gift lists, planning extravagant menus, and organising the annual extended family get together are all great reasons to be excited, none of them really compare to that which is described in Isaiah chapter 65. Here, God tells of all that is going to happen when Jesus returns. He says, I will create a new heaven and a new earth. The things that have happened before will not be remembered. I will take delight in my people. The people will be filled with joy forever. Weeping and crying will not be heard anymore. My people will live and enjoy life for a long time. I will bless the people. I will also bless their children after them. Wolves and lambs will eat together. None of those animals will harm or destroy. Isaiah is providing a beautiful image of all that God will do when Jesus returns. He is telling us about the thing that we should most look forward to in life. God promises a future so wonderful that all sadness, sickness, sorrow and suffering will be wiped away forever. Here, God says that this should fill us with great anticipation, but also great hope, peace and joy. And what's even more exciting is that this future is promised to each and every one of God's children. One day we will be with God and Jesus forever in his kingdom. So although we wait full of excitement about Christmas and all that it will bring this year, remember we not only celebrate the birth of Christ, but we also long for and look forward to that day when he returns. We can look forward to a new heaven and a new earth because Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. We can look forward to that future because God has fundamentally dealt with the problem of sin, evil, and death through Jesus' death and resurrection. And so that means that we're a people waiting in anticipation of Jesus' return. One of the ways that we point to that one of the ways that we prepare is by confessing our sin and rejoicing in the forgiveness that Jesus has brought us. And so I'd love to invite you to pray this prayer of confession with me on the screen as we humbly come before God, admitting how we have fallen short individually, but also as a whole people. So would you pray this prayer of confession with me? God of all mercy, we humbly admit that we need your help. We have wandered from your way. We have sinned in thought, word and deed and have failed to do what is right. You alone can save us. Have mercy on us. Wipe out our sins and teach us to forgive others. Bring forth in us the fruit of your spirit that we may live the new life to your glory. This we ask in the name of Jesus our Saviour. Amen extraordinary news that God desires that none should perish, but that all should turn to Christ and live. In response to his call, we acknowledge our sins, and God pardons those who humbly repent and truly believe the gospel. Therefore, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. It's now time for our Bible reading. So if you've got a Bible or a Bible app, it'd be great to have that open and ready as we come to God's Word. The first reading today is Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 to 25. Isaiah 65, beginning at verse 17. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. 
The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them, or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will enjoy, long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labour in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer, and while they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and the dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is Second Peter chapter 3. Verses 3 to 13. 2 Peter 3, beginning at verse 3. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming he's promised? Ever since our ancestors died, Everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forgot that long ago by words God's words, the heavens come into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that times has delusioned and destroyed. By the same words, the present heaven and us are labeled for fire, deserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will appear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people are you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and the Spanish coming, that they will be bring about the destruction of the heaven by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. This is the word of the Lord. Well, if you have a Bible, Bible app, it'd be great to keep that open to Second Peter. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one at the back. For this morning, we are in our last week of our Advent series as... We prepare to celebrate Christmas. But first, let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you for the gift of our Saviour Jesus. 
please help us to grow in understanding of who Jesus is, what he has done, and what he will come to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Growing up, our family holiday was one week at the beach. The same place every year. The same beach, the same accommodation. And so it meant that the moment we arrived, we could relax. We knew where our favourite beach was, our favourite pool, and even our favourite pay TV channel. Our holiday pattern didn't really change that much year to year. So because we knew how good our last holiday had been, it meant that we eagerly looked forward to the next, confident that it would be a fun week away. Maybe you feel the same about holidays, or eating your favourite takeaway, or watching your favourite movie. Because of what you've experienced, what has come, you look forward to enjoying it again. At Christmas, we get to celebrate and rejoice that God has come, which would also help us to look forward with joy that God will come again. The baby in the manger reminds us that Jesus has come and should fill us with hope and anticipation that he will come again in glory. This hope should fill us with more joy than waiting for our next holiday and even more than a child's anticipation of Christmas morning. For Jesus will come again to create all things new soon. First, Jesus will come again. So from chapter 3, verse 1. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Saviour through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. <coughs> People have all sorts of strange ideas about the promise that Jesus will come again. And amongst early Christians, there was confusion too. And really, it's not that surprising. Jesus said that he'd come back. So, where is he? For those Peter writes to, they've been waiting years and decades for Jesus to return. And well, for us, well, we've been waiting centuries and even millennia. So should Jesus coming just be a promise that we abandon at this point? For Peter, for the church throughout history, and for Jesus, the promise that Jesus would come again is an essential doctrine, an essential part of understanding who Jesus is, what he has done, and what he will come to do. It is central to Christian belief and hope, so much so that it is embedded in the creeds. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. As Christians, we believe that Jesus will come again. He will come again in judgment and establish his everlasting kingdom. This is not something a bunch of Christians just made up but it's what Jesus himself promised. In many places, Jesus spoke about his return in glory. Through parables, he taught that his return would be imminent, surprising, and certain. It wouldn't be the end of time, but the beginning of forever. Now, talk of Jesus' return can seem a little bit lofty and a little bit detached from reality. It's so easy to just feel overwhelmed by today that we can be in danger of applying that same focus to Christianity. Can't we just focus on the problems of today? But as the past few months have shown, the more we focus on the problems of our world today, 
the law they just seem to multiply. The world has obvious problems and our lives have obvious fault lines. Only focusing on today doesn't seem to be fixing things. If Jesus coming was a once-off event, if Jesus lived, died, and left us to be in control, then our hope for any change is now up to us. And our track record is not so good. But this is not the Christian story. Yes, Jesus did live, die, and return to the Father. And yes, Jesus commissioned his disciples to carry on his work in the power of the Spirit. But we do so living in the reality that Jesus is alive and he will come again. God has come and God will come again. We serve him now in anticipation of that not yet seen, but are confident that it will happen at any time. We can look at today with hope, for Jesus will come again. And Jesus will come again to create all things new. So from verse 5. But they deliberately forgot that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. God's people have always expected that the beginning of the kingdom of God would also be marked by a day of judgment. Now, a day of judgment sounds pretty frightening, but actually God's people looked forward to when that day would happen. The day of the Lord was a good day when God's kingdom would come and perfect justice would be done. So when the scoffers suggest that Jesus won't come back, they also mean that the world will just continue and we will avoid judgment. Now, that might sound comforting, maybe much more appealing than a day of judgment. But living in a world where suffering and injustice continue unchecked is not comforting. We long for true justice to be done. Peter demonstrates that God will not let the world just tick over, but that he is actively at work. The beginning of creation is there because God made it and set it in motion. The flood during Noah's lifetime, the waters that deluged and destroyed are signs of God's judgment brought forward. And today, God sustains and preserves the world. But there will be a time when judgment and destruction of the ungodly will come. God is actively at work. He is not going to let sin continue on forever. And judgment is part of the story of Scripture and a part of the story of salvation. The creator is the only one qualified to be the judge. Now, we don't like judgment, mostly because we're faulty judges. We miss things, we miss seeing the whole picture, we're swayed by our own interests. I really hate it when judgment just seems to perpetuate injustice and is incomplete. The good news is that on the day of the Lord, the one who judges is the only one perfectly qualified to judge. God the Father entrusts this role of judgment to God the Son, the one who has already entered into the history of the world, who perfectly understands the challenges of being human, who knows what it's like to be unfairly accused who took on himself our punishment, who laid down his life on the cross for the weight of our sin. Jesus is our saviour and Jesus is our judge. He is the one who both proclaims the Lord's favour and the Lord's judgment. 
Jesus himself claims that he has given authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. And in John's Gospel, Jesus describes the day of judgment, where he will return. All will hear his voice. All the dead will be raised and Jesus will judge the world. Everyone will come before him, those who have listened and followed Jesus and those who have not. Part of the path to things being set right is for Jesus to rightly judge. Judgment is how Jesus is making everything new. We so desperately long for the suffering of the world and the brokenness of our lives to be mended. We need Jesus to deal with the sin of the world and with the sin in us we harbour, enjoy and ignore. Isaiah 65 transports us to that future. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. The future we anticipate is one of peace and abundant joy. Because sin and death is eradicated, weeping and crying is replaced with rejoicing. Through judgment, Jesus will create all things new. Your favourite place, your favourite holiday, your favourite Christmas cannot compare to the beauty, peace and delight and joy that Jesus will offer, usher in when he returns. If you have trusted in Jesus' death for you, then there is no need to fear the day of judgment, but look forward to it with joy. Jesus will come again to create all things new soon. Verse 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. In waiting for Jesus' return, we see that the Lord's patience is not because he has forgotten or broken his promise. The Lord's patience means salvation, and the Lord's coming should shape the character of our lives. We wait actively in anticipation that Jesus will return at any moment. This is not like waiting for a friend at dinner, wondering if they've remembered. For God does not forget. He is the perfect promise keeper. It's just that as the sustainer of the whole universe, days operate a little bit differently. A day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. We don't wait by trying to predict when he will return. Jesus said he didn't even know when that would be. We wait by shaping our lives with the priorities of the kingdom yet to come. Just look at the reasons that Peter gives for what might seem like a delay to us. Jesus' patience is so that everyone may come to repentance so that no one perishes. Jesus' delay is not motivated by forgetfulness, but by love. Our Lord's patience means salvation. It means that those on our front lines, our friends, family, neighbours, colleagues, continue to have opportunities to come to the Lord of life to repent and follow our Saviour and our Redeemer. Because of Jesus, that Jesus is coming soon, our invitation and evangelism should be motivated by Jesus' imminent return. Verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. <coughs> Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. 
Not knowing the hour doesn't mean that we sit around doing nothing, for our Lord is not sitting down doing nothing. Hear the urgent language that Peter uses. The day of the Lord is coming like a thief. We're not to respond by arming the house, but in how we live as people wherever we are. How we live reflects the confidence we have in who will come, that he is coming, and the kingdom that he will establish. In Revelation, the return of Jesus is like the return of a bridegroom to a wedding feast, where the bride is the people of God. Even though in our typical weddings, the bride is the last to arrive, in the first century context, the bride would wait for the groom to come and bring her to the home he has prepared. It would be a noisy and joyous procession as the bride is brought to her new home and the marriage would result in the whole community rejoicing. Now, Jesus' return can often feel fairly distant to our day-to-day lives. Whole weeks could go by without a second thought to this core doctrine. But we want to keep on remembering every day because that will shape our lives and the people we become. Like a bride, we wait patiently with confidence of the one we'll soon behold. We wait with holy and godly lives. We wait knowing the world with its suffering and sin will not continue on forever. But soon Jesus will return in glory and all will be set right. When we celebrate the baby born in the manger, it is a reminder of this is not God's only gift to us. The risen Jesus will return again and once and for all create all things new. Right now, his patience brings salvation. So we wait with holy and godly lives, eager to welcome our King, come in glory, enjoy the new heavens and earth he will create. So this Christmas, looking back and looking ahead, we can sing joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you that not only did you send your son to us for our salvation, but that Jesus is risen and will return again. Lord, help us not to be distracted or disheartened as we wait. And we pray that you would be at work in this in-between time, drawing our friends and family to you in repentance. By your spirit, help us to be people waiting with holy and godly lives, ready for when you return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Please be seated. As we're led in prayer this morning, the very first thing I'm going to invite you to do is join with me in the Lord's Prayer, but also in a form of prayer of statement and response. It's actually a really ancient, it's an ancient tradition, and it can seem a bit weird culturally saying things together, but it's actually countercultural, for it not only reminds us of what we share but that we are not only individuals, but we are a people. And so it's good, we affirm and we pray together as a people, we are God's people. So as we begin, would you say and share in the Lord's Prayer with me? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Be exalted, Lord, above the heavens. Let your glory cover the earth. Keep our nation under your care. Guide us in justice and truth. Let your way be known on earth, having power among all nations. Send out your light and your truth, that we may tell of your saving works. Have mercy on the poor and oppressed. Hear the cry of those in need. Hear our prayers, O Lord, for we put our trust in you. We're going to continue to be led in prayer. Let us pray for the world and the church. Loving God, we thank you that because of Jesus we have hope. Please help us this Christmas to remember that you, God of the universe, entered into our world, revealing yourself through Jesus 
and provided a way that we can be saved. We thank you that because of Jesus and his death and resurrection, that we can have new life. We thank you that this hope is for all people. Help us share this good news of hope to our families, friends, and those on our front lines this Christmas. Dear God, our world is torn apart through war and violence. We remember communities impacted by conflicts in Gaza, Israel, Ukraine, South Sudan, and Syria. We pray that you provide this world with a peace that is only found in you. We pray for the leaders who have the power to bring peace. May they be touched by a spirit of compassion and kindness and have a desire to bring an end to the violence. We pray for those who are suffering from the results of war, those who are homeless, wounded, grieving and traumatised. We ask that you provide them both with physical and mental healing. Give strength, wisdom and resilience to health workers and aid workers. Enable, to, uh, enable aid to reach the areas that need it most. Comfort those who have lost so much. May they know your love and strength. We pray for an end to all the trauma and hurting. We ask for your love to reign over all. Gracious God, we pray for those impacted by the ravages of flooding and bushfires. Grant them encouragement, strength, fortitude, patience and insight as they struggle with their many losses, material, physical, emotional and personal. And as they begin to pick up the pieces and create a new future for themselves, their families and their communities. Be for them a beacon of unwavering hope and confidence that there can and will be a better day. Surround them with your love and the love and compassion of others that they might be sustained in this time of trouble. We pray for those who are experiencing loss during this Christmas season, relational, financial, spiritual and physical. We pray for those who are coping with loving a prodigal and our friends and family members whose hearts are far from you. Help us to continue to love, to care, even when it is tough. For those for whom Christmas brings painful memories, we pray that you would enable healing for those who hurt and comfort for those who grieve. We thank you for our nation Australia, for the freedom we have to worship you and to celebrate the birth of Jesus. We pray for our leaders at all levels of government and for our lawmakers. May they be men and women of integrity. Give them the courage to make decisions that are in line with your will. Lord, we thank you for all our mission partners and their faithful service in their mission fields. And we ask that you would keep them safe and well over this Christmas season. May they know your peace and wisdom and comfort those who find Christmas a challenging time. Father God, we thank you for the many ministries here at St Bart's and all who serve. We commit the upcoming Christmas services to you and we pray that all attending may discover anew your incredible love for us as we hear the good news of Jesus that brings hope and joy to all people. We pray these prayers in the name of Jesus. Amen. Faithful God, you have promised to hear the prayers of all who ask in Jesus' name. In your mercy, please accept our prayers. Give us what we have asked in faith according to your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It is so good to welcome you to St Bart's today and just want to add a particular word of welcome. If you're new to St Bart's, we're so delighted that you're here and I want to invite you to complete a Next Steps card if you are new, if you'd love to get connected. You can pick up one of these just from the Next Steps wall in the foyer or you can scan the QR code on the screen or in the news and complete one that way. But either way, one of the team will be in contact, so I encourage you to do that. We've got a few shout-outs to share this morning. Julie says, good morning and happy Christmas to all today. Very special time of year, God bless. The Arthur say, good morning, St. Bart's family. Merry Christmas to everyone. And Gary says, strong sermon, I thought. <laughs> so a big welcome to everyone online today. 
Each week, as we gather as God's people, we highlight one aspect of our life together. So as we seek to make and mature disciples of Jesus, we're formed in our rhythms of life of gather, grow, give and serve. This week, we're highlighting the aspect of give and really just want to encourage you and invite you that if you count yourself as a, a member of St. Bart's, a, a regular attender, and you're not yet a regular giver, really encourage you to consider that prayerfully. If you need any information, you can look up our website or on the back of the news or have a chat to someone at the Next Steps wall today. They'd be very happy to, to help you out, so I encourage you to do that. Well, 2024 is just around the corner. We actually have one more Sunday, okay, next Sunday before 2024, but a few, few important things to highlight. Our 2024 calendar is out, so you can download this of our website. You can just go to stbarnes.com.au forward slash 2024, or you can pick up a printed copy up the back, or you may have received one as you came in today. But that's got all the important dates and events for the upcoming year. You can read of what's happening in our training centre, our Centre for Work and Faith, along with our leadership development activities as well. So please take one of those, make note of some of those dates, and you might also like to take some time this week, it'd be really helpful, to really pray, to commit all that to the Lord. We, we have been doing that and we keep doing that, but as we seek to be faithful and ask that God would bless our plans and that we'd continue to be responsive in the power of his spirit as we hear how he directs us and leads us over the coming years. So I encourage you to do that. Also, the in, o, expressions of interest have opened for our internships for next year. So these one day a week paid positions to really explore ministry. And they can be in any aspect of ministry in the life of our church. So if you know someone or if you'd like to be considered for one of those internships, you can find out more on our website, same address, stbarts.com.au forward slash 2024 or feel free to have a chat to someone at the Next Steps War or have a chat to myself. I'm really excited, as we've shared over the last couple of weeks, that on January 7, so it's the first Sunday in January, children will be once again gathering in this space at the beginning of the service and then going out after the Kids Talk to the St. Bart's Kids Program. So the same check-in process before the service, but then gathering here for our time of gathered singing, and then kids talk, and then out to the kids program. So you might not be aware, but we used to do that pre-COVID. So you remember pre-COVID, way back then? <laughs> we used to gather in this space, and the kids go out. Well, we're now in a position where we can do that again, so that's really exciting, so good for us as a community in so many ways. But if you've got any questions or concerns about that, have a chat to one of the St. Bart's Kids check-in team after the service. They'd be really happy to chat that through and answer any questions that you might have. Another exciting thing coming up in 2024 is our Alpha course. This is an amazing space to come along, meet some new friends, but ask big questions about life and faith with others too. You can join us in person where you get to share a meal together every week, or you can also join us online. So if you have questions or you've never had an opportunity um, to ask them with others, I'd love to invite you to come and join us. Or maybe there might be someone in your life, someone on your front lines who you see regularly, who you would love to come and see who Jesus is. I encourage you to invite them. Come and try Alpha. You can pick up plenty of postcards today. And so we'd love to have you along. You can just try it for one uh, night and see what it's like. And this Christmas, we'd love to also extend an invitation that we would love to be praying for you, whatever that might be. Or maybe that's something you could also offer to the people that you get to spend the next few days with, that how can we be praying for you this Christmas? You can just go to sabards.com.au forward slash alpha, and there you'll see a button where you can let us know what your prayer point is, and we count it as a great privilege to be praying for you this Christmas. Well, hopefully you're aware that it's Christmas Eve. I hope that doesn't come as a shock to, to anyone. But, but this morning, so, you know, in secret, this is just the end of Advent right now. But after our final song, it's now Christmas Eve, okay? So, a few services coming up. Love to invite you along, of course, but also invite others along. So, Christmas Eve tonight, 6 p.m., multi-generational service, lots of fun, hive of activity. Then 11 p.m., 
acquired our more traditional service, and then Christmas Day tomorrow, 7.30 traditional service, 9.30 contemporary service as well. All those services are live streamed, but I really want to encourage you to invite someone along. We know that often the only thing stopping someone gathering on a Sunday or coming along to a Christmas service is the lack of an invitation. And we find that often the very last minute invitation, even I will pick you up and come with me, is so effective. So I really encourage you to do that. You could really make someone's Christmas this year by simply gathering, inviting them along, that we can rejoice in the good news of Jesus together. So I encourage you to uh, really do that. There are still some postcards and flies. Take those, give them to people, invite them along tonight and tomorrow. Also, after the service, if you have a need for prayer for anything at all, please know that one of the prayer team, just up in the back corner, they would love to pray with you today. They would love that privilege. And please do stay for some morning tea. We've got tea, coffee. You might not want to be rushing out to the car park yet anyway. <laughs> so stay for some hot tea and coffee. It'd be great to catch up as we encourage one another and really prepare to celebrate once again the good news that Christ has come to us. Right now, I'd love to invite you to stand as we pray and as we sing. Gracious Lord, we thank you for the phenomenal news that you have sent your Son to us. We thank you that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Lord, we pray, please, in the power of your Spirit, may we have a constant presence of heart and mind, anticipating your imminent return, when your Son will come in glory. May that reality shape every moment of our living. In Jesus' name, amen.
Lord Jesus Christ, send us out with confidence in your word to tell the world of your saving acts and bring glory to your name. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Name of Christ. Amen. Thank you.